Those were the bells. <laughs> Jane, don't do that to me when I'm facing that way. <laughs> uh, well, you know, we have a problem with the organ. I, I think I can explain it this way. We have a former member that's here today, Scott Bates, and his, his wife and his family. And he used to sit back by the organ when he sang in the <laughs> choir. And he would coax that organ along, and it saw him today when he walked in, and it got so excited it just broke down. <laughs> I don't know if that's a theological explanation or not, so <laughs> probably not. So we're happy you're with us today as we celebrate uh, the fourth Sunday after Easter. This is known as, you ready for another Latin term today? Cantate. Now that one you might uh, uh, hear something, you hear... If you know music of the past, there were cantatas that are sung sometimes in churches. It simply means to sing. Uh, to sing for joy, especially, is the idea that comes from this psalm. It's from Psalm 98, which, by the way, is the psalm from which we get joy to the world, the hymn joy to the world. Um, so we sing for joy because of what the Lord has done in his resurrection and in his life for us. This is also begin not the Pentecost season itself, but it's the turn to Pentecost. As we hear the Savior speaking of the promise of the Holy Spirit that will come to guide his people into the way of truth. So uh, we got two more Sundays, this Sunday and next Sunday, and then Ascension Day takes place, and then following that comes into the Pentecost season. So our service today will follow the... Uh, Order of service, that's on page 154, setting one with Holy Communion. And that service begins with the singing of our opening hymn, 452, The Strife <laughs> is O'er. Please rise. As again, we follow the order of service setting one. You'll find that on page 154 in the front of the hymnal. And we ask the congregation to speak or to sing the words that you'll find printed in the bold print for you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. 
If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God have mercy on me, a sinner. And we take a moment of silence to reflect on those words. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only son, Jesus Christ, as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we continue on page 156. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory be to God on the high, and on earth peace, good will toward men. We praise you, we bless you, we worship you. We glorify you, we give thanks to you for your great glory. O Lord God, heavenly King, God the Father Almighty, O Lord, the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, O Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You take away the sin of the world, receive our prayer. You sit at the right hand of God the Father, have mercy on us. For you only are holy, you only are the Lord. You only, O Christ, with the Holy Spirit, are most high in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, you form the minds of your faithful people into a single will. Make us to love what you command and to desire what you promise, that among the many changes of this world, our hearts may ever yearn for the lasting joys of heaven. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The congregation may be seated. And we now turn our attention to the scripture lessons that are appointed for today. Again, it's the fourth Sunday after Easter, known as Cantate, or Sing to the Lord. 
you care to follow along, you'll find the lessons listed on the back side of your paper for this morning, on the bulletin. <coughs> All of our lessons speak of the goodness of the Lord towards his people, although the first lesson would not seem to indicate that as much as God, through his prophet Isaiah in chapter 29, is speaking woes upon the city of uh, Jerusalem to the city of David because of its waywardness from him. But in that, it's also an indication that they need someone. They need someone for the Lord to send to them, which we hear later on will be the Holy Spirit to guide his people in the correct way, because so often they can go apart from him. We read in Isaiah chapter 29. Be stunned, be amazed. Blind yourselves and be blind. They are drunk, but not with wine. They stagger, but not from beer. For the Lord has poured out a spirit of deep sleep over you. He has closed your eyes, the prophets. He has covered your heads, the seers. For you, this whole vision has become like the words of a sealed scroll. If you give it to someone who can read and you say, read this, please, he will say, I can't, it is sealed. And if you give it to someone who cannot read and you say, read this, please, he will say, I can't read. The Lord says, these people approach me with their words, and they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is nothing but commandments taught by men. So watch how I will continue to amaze these people with amazing, extraordinary things. The wisdom of the wise will perish, and the intelligence of the intelligent will be hidden. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second lesson today is the epistle lesson this morning. Recorded in James chapter 1, verses 17 to 21. The Heavenly Father gives good gifts, is the main thought that he gives here. And there is no other greater gift, perhaps, that he gives than his Son, first of all, as the Savior, and then the Holy Spirit to guide us in the way of life. We read in James chapter 1. Every good act of giving and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the lights, who does not change or shift like a shadow. Just as he planned, he gave us birth by the word of truth, so that we would be a kind of first fruits of his creations. Remember this, my dear brothers. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Certainly a man's anger does not bring about what is right before God. So after getting rid of all moral filthiness and overflowing wickedness, receive with humility the word planted in you. It is able to save your souls. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now we join together in a singing of the gospel acclamation for today. That will be on the Easter season, page 161 in the front part of your hymnal. Page 161. You are familiar with, I, I believe, the melody of these by now. So Jane will uh, introduce that and we'll follow with the singing of the refrain, then the seasonal verse for Easter, and close with the refrain again. <laughs> Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Praise God for a living hope. Christ is risen up from the dead. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Please rise for the reading of the gospel. The gospel lesson for today is recorded in the book of John, chapter 16, verses 5 to 15. This takes place on Monday, Thursday evening, as Jesus is preparing his disciples to go out to the Garden of Gethsemane. He knows what lies ahead of them, and he promises that he will be gone, but he will send them someone else to help them. That would be the Holy Spirit. He, 
It's given a very special name in the scriptures. You may hear of this in some of our hymns. You don't hear it quite frequently, but it's known as the paraclete. The paraclete comes from a Greek word that means someone who is called to stand at your side and to help you. It's got all kinds of ramifications in the idea that he will be your counselor, he will be your lawyer, he will be your comforter, he will be your helper, he'll be your advisor. It just has a whole bunch of different nuances to it. But think of it as someone called to your side to support you in every situation. We read in John chapter 16. But now I am going away to him who sent me, and not one of you asks me, where are you going? Yet because I have told you these things, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I am telling you the truth. It is good for you that I go away. For if I do not go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world about sin, about righteousness, and about judgment about sin because they do not believe in me, about righteousness because I am going to the Father and you will no longer see me, about judgment because the ruler of this world has been condemned. I still have many things to tell you, but you cannot bear them now. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own, but whatever he hears, he will speak. He will also declare to you what is to come. He will glorify me because he will take from what is mine and declare it to you. Everything the Father has is mine. This is why I said that he takes from what is mine and will declare it to you. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to you, O Christ. The congregation may be seated as we continue with the singing of our next hymn. That will be hymn number 481, Alleluia, Let Praises Ring.
Grace be yours and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. This morning we look at the gospel lesson for the day, reading, thinking mostly of the uh, first paragraph of that, from John chapter 16, starting at verse 5. I'll begin at, hmm, I'll begin at verse 6. Yet because I have told you these things, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I am telling you the truth. It is good for you that I go away. For if I do not go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world about sin, about righteousness, and about judgment. About sin, because they do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I am going to the Father, and you will no longer see me. About judgment, because the ruler of this world has been condemned. In Christ Jesus, dear fellow, redeemed in our Lord. Now I am going to the one who sent me, Jesus said. And then, both before and after this, he explained to them that he was going to go to the cross, first of all. This was a simple announcement that the Lord Jesus made. He's unruffled. Tranquilly, he tells the disciples of what we have to call the greatest event in the history of the world ever since the creation of all things. He will die for the sins of the whole world. No fear grips his heart. No trepidation is found within his spirit. No quivering of the lips. Very calmly, quietly, collectedly, he speaks. Now, it's not going to be easy but in the end, he knows that he's going to emerge as the victor. With his eyes then on the crown that awaits for him in heaven, he faces the cruelty of the cross that lies just before him, and he does not flinch one bit in going towards that. But what a different reaction you get from the disciples. To them, it's like a fatal blow from which they can't recover. They will lose their friend, their mentor, their master. So they have a lot of sorrow and confusion and fear that's gripping their hearts. Think of their situation, which Jesus actually addressed a little bit earlier than that. Think of their situation like that of a child who has just immediately lost his parents. They're taken so unexpectedly from him at such a tender and a very vulnerable age. They're now an orphan who has lost those who have guided them so far. There's no one to care for him in the world, no one to guide him anymore, no one that he can, in a sense, trust. He's alone in a hostile world. Consider the plight that the disciples faced and how they felt from that standpoint. Until now, they had not been without the Lord Jesus at all. He'd always been an arm's length away for them, to counsel them, to provide for them, to protect them, to deliver them from any harm that could come. But now his announcement of leaving them simply threw them into a tizzy. Who's going to guide them? Who's going to cheer them? Who's going to instruct them? Who's going to show them the way of life? How could they carry on? And through all of that, their thoughts are really just on themselves. They didn't even have the sense to ask Jesus where he was going, how things were going to affect him. They failed to consider also the gain that was going to be there of which he spoke here when he was gone from their presence. And you say, the gain? What gain could there be? How could you be better off without the Lord Jesus at your side? Now, that's an odd thought for us to consider. Those who love the Lord, it's an odd thought to consider that we could be better off without the Lord Jesus at our side. So how could we be better off without Jesus around us? He's our creator, he's our provider, he's our protector, and above all, he's our redeemer. He alone opens the door of paradise to us. 
So would a Christian ever dare to say that he or she would be better off without the Lord Jesus around them? Yet there is a way that we are better off with Jesus gone. Jesus actually said that, and it was true. He said, I tell you the truth, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the counselor, now that's the Holy Spirit, that's that special word that I mentioned before, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. There's no question about it. Jesus' presence among the disciples brought them such a great blessing. How greatly they were going to miss that. But his departure would bring them even greater blessings. And that was hard for them to see at this point. How could that be possible? It would be possible through the Holy Spirit who would take over in the lives of the disciples and then in the life of the church on earth. He would do even greater things, in a sense, through it. Now, how could that be? Think of the importance of Jesus going away and the Holy Spirit coming from this perspective. Let's simply call Jesus' work of redemption, call that the outer work. All right? Well, what I mean by that is this. He came to die on the cross to pay the price for the sin of the whole world. And he comes to reconcile us before God by what he did. Without him physically standing in our place, we would have been lost forever. So think of his work as being this outer work, redemption. But that outer work would do us no good whatsoever unless we could receive its benefits inwardly in our lives and in our hearts. The imparting of the blessing of salvation into our hearts and into our lives, that is not accomplished by Jesus. That is the job of the Holy Spirit. He brings us to faith. He brings us to the enjoyments of the gifts that Jesus won for us that we experience within ourselves. The Spirit is necessary to bring about the fulfillment of the blessings of Christ's redemptive work in people's lives. That's the way salvation works. God the Father so loved the world when it was unlovable in its sin. He made the provisions to save us by sending his beloved Son into the world to pay the price for the sin that we could not pay for. Through that Son's work, God justified us to himself by what his Son had done in our place. And then when Jesus' work was done, he sent the Holy Spirit to work in the the life of faith within the believers' hearts and to empower them to bring this message to the world. If you don't trust what the Father has given in his love, if you don't trust what the Son has done for you in his love, what good would it be to you? So he sent the Holy Spirit to work that within us. And that working of faith is the realm of the Holy Spirit. It's his job. It's his inner work that he works within our lives of faith. It's necessary. And with Jesus gone, then the Holy Spirit's work could go forward. He came to help us. And what a great help he is. That's one of the important meanings behind the work word paraclete for the Holy Spirit. He is our helper and comforter. You see, this was the beginning of a new phase, you might say, in God's plan of salvation to the world. And it was promised before Jesus even completed his work on the cross. On the one hand, it was going to be difficult to watch Jesus do that because they loved the Lord Jesus so much, they didn't want to see him go away from them. But on the other hand, it would be a life-changing event a necessary phrase that instead of harming them as they falsely initially thought, would actually propel them and take them forward. Maybe we could compare that somewhat to a time in our lives that called for a change, whatever that change might be. You approach that change, I think, with a measure of fear, (laughs) trepidation, 
initially, you may not even want to follow through on what that is, but it was needed because that change would become an advantage to you and it took you forward in life. And even more so as the God led you forward. And that's what Jesus' departure meant for his disciples. Sadly, they couldn't see it at first because their thoughts, like us, so often is just on ourselves. How could they cope? How could they cope without him around? But Jesus promised that his departure was actually going to be a step forward for them and for us and for his church at large. For with Jesus gone, the comforter, the helper, the guide, the counselor, the Holy Spirit would now be sent to help them. And what a great help he was as a new age really dawned upon the church on earth at that time. Through the guidance of the Holy Spirit, the disciples were enabled then to go out into the world with the great good news of the gospel of salvation and a savior. You see, the blessings of Christ's redemption, they're not just meant for you and for me. They are for others too. And with Jesus gone, the Holy Spirit is sent to help the world and to help you in that world. Well, how would he do this? Jesus continued, when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment, concerning sin because they do not believe in me, concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer, concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. Convicting and convincing the world of sin and its need of God's righteousness before his judgment falls upon the world. That's hard to do. Have you ever tried to convince an unchurched person that they need the Lord Jesus and they need to go to church? Have you ever tried to convince them that they have to be about the Father's business and not be so concerned with their own? Sometimes that's even hard to convince members of that. We need help. The question is, how do you convince people of something about which they don't even seem to care of? Furthermore, if the world raised such a resistance against the Son of God so that it crucified him, how could you ever hope to influence the world and to reach out to them with the gospel? <coughs> Enter the Holy Spirit. Jesus said he will convict the world. Think of that this way. He's like a prosecuting attorney who hammers away at the heart as it receives the word of God whenever God's word is spoken to accuse people of the guilt for sin and its eternal consequences. It's what he did for you. And for me, when he brought us to faith in Christ as a Savior, he convinced you, he convinced me of the need for convicting us. People don't like being convicted for the wrong that they have done. But it's necessary. Otherwise, how is improvement ever going to take place in their lives if they don't understand and realize what's taken place? Such conviction really has two parts to it as the Holy Spirit works this. One is that the Holy Spirit cuts into the heart with the truth of God's word. He's like a sharp sword that penetrates deeply within. In fact, the Apostle Paul uses the phrase that Scripture is the sword of the Spirit to judge the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Those things that oppose God. Maybe it seems to you at times that you aren't doing so well convincing a person of their need before God because a, a person doesn't seem to respond to what you say about this. To the eye, it doesn't appear that any good is coming out of what you are telling them from the word of God. But what you can't see is the Holy Spirit working within the heart of an individual. He continues that work within to help make that person realize and lament their sin. 
And that's the reason you just keep on witnessing to the law and the gospel, even when it seems to be so unfruitful as far as your attempts to your own eye. You don't convince the person. That's the job of the Holy Spirit. That's what he does. And he needs the truth of the word of God to work on that. And his convincing is more than just a convicting. Cutting a person to the heart. What good would that do if there wasn't a cure for the problem? That's part of the Holy Spirit's work too. As he shows a person the need for the righteousness that Jesus fulfilled for us. Think of the work of the Holy Spirit as that of a great skilled surgeon. First thing a surgeon does when he goes to work on a patient is it appears that he hurts the patient by cutting into him. He exposes that which is bad. Then he takes out that which is bad, and next he closes up the wound so that healing can take place. In matters of salvation, that's not Jesus' work. It's not the Father's work. It's the Holy Spirit's work. He is a skilled surgeon whose work is to help the world and help us in the world as we witness to these things. What a great help he really is. Jesus promised that he would send them even before he was on the cross to complete the work of salvation. I'm sure glad that he's here because with Jesus gone, that spirit is such a great help to us in our world in a way that is going to be to an advantage. You don't think of that so much when you hear the news of the world today. Who would think that we would be better off without the Savior's presence? But in this way, Jesus promised that the Holy Spirit would always be at our side to comfort us, to guide us, to counsel us, to help us in every special way as we brought the message of God's word to people. Isn't it something really how the Father and then the Son and then the Holy Spirit are all working together for our good? God always grants us the assurance of that and our faith in him. For Jesus' sake, amen. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please remain standing as we now unite with all Christians in confessing our faith. Today we do that in the words of the Nicene Creed. You'll find that on page 162 in the front part of the service, page 162. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge baptism for the remission of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The congregation may be seated, but if you would keep your hymnals open to page 164. As before the offering, we join together in a responsive prayer of the church. Page 164. Almighty God and Father, we thank you for all your mercies, especially for the gift of your Son, through whom you have revealed your gracious will. 
We praise you for the Holy Spirit and his working through the means of grace. Plant your word in our hearts and cause it to produce fruit in our lives. Strengthen and defend your church, that by your word and sacraments faith may grow and love toward all may increase. Support all who spread the light of your truth through the world. Keep our children in the grace of their baptisms. Enable their parents to train them in lives of faith. Raise up Christians to serve you in the ministry of the word and in all godly walks of life. Preserve our nation in justice and honor. Guide and bless all who make, administer, and judge our laws. Give them wisdom that they may promote justice and hinder evil. Let your blessing rest on planting and harvest, commerce and industry, medicine and science, the arts and culture. Protect all who travel and care for those whose work is difficult or dangerous. Be with all who devote themselves to any useful task. Comfort all who are in sorrow or need, sickness or adversity. Remember those who suffer persecution for the faith. Have mercy on those for whom death draws near. Grant them your love and take them into your tender care. And now hear us, Lord, as we each pray in silence. We thank you, dear Lord, for promising and then sending us your Holy Spirit to be our comfort, guide, and help in life. He is a great advantage to us as you have now departed from this world, although you are always with us to the end of this world. But the Holy Spirit is now there to help us in reaching out to the world with the gospel and help us in our own lives of faith in you. We remember then with thanksgiving also those through whom the Spirit has worked, whom you have loved and served you, who now rest from their labors. Console those who are mourning or living with sadness. Keep us in the true faith and bring us at last to the joys of heaven. Grant us these things, fathers, for the sake of Jesus, who died and rose again. Amen. Amen. And we now worship our Lord in bringing our offerings to him. We give thee but thine own, whatever the gift may be, all that we have is thine alone, a trust, O Lord, from thee. Lord, in Christ you have given us so many blessings, the blessings of redemption. He also helps and provides for all of our needs, even as you, the Heavenly Father, provide for us in everything that we have. And the Holy Spirit is always guiding us in life. So with all of you working together for our good, we bring a portion of the gifts that you have given to us here in this life. Use them to your glory and so that the gospel might be preached in the world. Hear us for your name's sake. Amen. And we now continue with the order of Holy Communion. You'll find that on page 165 in the front of the hymnal. Page 165. 
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who by his willing sacrifice on the cross took away the sins of the world and by his glorious resurrection restored everlasting life. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Holy, holy, holy Lord God of heavenly hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he, blessed is he, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. We give thanks to you, O God, through your dear Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent to be our Savior, our Redeemer and the messenger of your grace. Through him you made all things. In him you are well pleased. He is the incarnate word, conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. To fulfill your promises, he stretched out his hands on the cross and released from eternal death all who believe in you. As we remember Jesus' death and resurrection, we thank you that you have gathered us together to receive your son's body and blood. Send us your spirit, unite us as one, and strengthen our faith so that we may praise you in your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we glorify and honor you, O God, our Father, with the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And we join in the prayer the Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the same night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, also after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is poured out for you for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And now may the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. O Christ, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. O Christ, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. O Christ, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, grant us your peace. Amen. And we now invite our communicant members to come forward to receive the Lord's Supper. Please follow the direction of our ushers.
body, this is through body and blood, and given and shed for the forgiveness of all sins. Grant a new and confirm you with that through faith to life everlasting. Depart in peace.
Please rise as we conclude the communion service on page 170 in the front part of your hymnal. Now towards the middle of the page with the responsive versicles and the blessing. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death we give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this saving gift. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now receive with believing hearts the benediction of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. Amen. Amen. The congregation may be seated as we join in the singing of our closing hymn, hymn number 950, Lord, bid your servant go in peace. 950. You know, Jane, I think uh, next week, if we can't get the organ fixed by then, there is a bell out in the... Uh, <laughs>
fellowship hall. We'll have you go tinkle, tinkle, tinkle. <laughs> <laughs> Unless Scott returns next week, then he could go dong, dong, dong. <laughs> Uh, we're happy to have you here today. Please make note of the announcements that are in your bulletin for this week. Uh, the new edition of Forward in Christ is in the back, if you haven't picked one up for May. And then at the end of the month, the meditations, devotions begin. Um, you can pick up a copy of that, too. I have to tell you something uh, sort of interesting that happens during the service at times. You know, interesting, whatever. For, for me, it is. Um, I don't know if you notice me smile at times, especially during communion. Well, I had a big smile at, because when Kendra came up today, Kendra hands off her, her son to Jim. <laughs> see, I get to see this. You don't get to see this. <laughs> and he looked at Jim like this. <laughs> it was the next thing that happened. Then he head-butted him. <laughs> In a, a gentle way, I think it was, wasn't it? Kind of like a... Not a kiss, but, you know, kind of along that line. So uh, endearment, I think. At least that's the way I took it. So I had to smile at that. So if you saw that. <laughs> um, Scott was going to tell us a little bit about what happened to their congregation. I don't know if you remember this. Scott is in Florida. That was where the, what hurricane was at this time? What is it? 